I like to keep an eye on it. If it comes right into your eye, we'll, um, <laughs> we'll wow. turn the tape off. And I've learned to drive like this. But, you know, with it. Well, what I just felt was, you know, this has got good natural light, but the, and I think it's past the time when it's going to shoot right over into your eye. But anyway, we will get started. And today is March 22nd, 2004. Yes. And I'm Kathy Newell. I'm talking with Margaret Joy Tibbetts today about her family who uh, came to Bethel in the early part of the 20th century. And what we're going to do today is explore a little bit about who her parents were and where they came from and something about their families. So, Margaret, I think that's what we could start with, would be the early antecedents in the various families. Thank so you. Can you tell me about them? Well, I'll tell you, and it's, I'm not scientific in the genealogist way. Mm -hmm. This is what I remember, frankly, right. and what I've been told, what other people remember. And uh, in a way, that's the most valuable historical material at times. You don't know. And how I, we started to get talking about this one day with my nephew Barry, mm -hmm. and he asked me, if I knew what he meant by Todd jokes, and I said, I certainly did. I'd been brought up on them. The Todds were a family in the neighborhood where my mother lived, and their antics were the same. We were all brought up on them. And he said, well, I'm terribly confused because mother told us, used to tell us these stories, and I don't know what is fact and what is fiction and who and why and what, but I do know the concept of Todd jokes. And I thought, well, I'm probably the only person in the world left <laughs> except for my cousin Elizabeth, who's since died, who does know what a Todd joke is in the family context. And I should tell Barry, because he knew nothing about anything. So I'll start out. First, I'll give you the cast of characters, the major people okay. about whom I'll be talking, and because I'll try to be consistent in how I speak of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about my immediate family, my father, whom I'll either call my father or the doctor, because we tended to always to call him the doctor mm -hmm. to other people, but in the family he was dad. And my mother, whom we just called mother, mm -hmm. and uh, only one person in town ever used her given name, which was Pearl. Mother hated the name Pearl, and the only person who ever called her Pearl was Betty Thurston, who lived on Broad Street. My father called her mother, and she called him father. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother Ashby, we called Ashby. My sister Mary, of course, was Mary. And I have to be careful here because Barry has a Mary Freeman. Mm -hmm. So I'll just speak of my sister as either my sister or as Mary. And Ashby was Ashby. And I was the youngest in the family. And I regret to say the family called me baby <laughs> until I was well into my college years. <laughs> Actually, the first time I came home from college, as a freshman, I was sitting at the dining room table with my mother and she automatically began to cut up my meat for me. Oh. So this, <laughs> this happens, it ruins the character, but uh, The family, immediate family, were Tibbetses and Ashby's. And I'll begin with the Tibbetses and get them out of the way fast. Uh, we were always very tactful, mother insisted on it, but we didn't have a very high opinion of the Tibbetses the uh, three of the three children and my mother herself, but we were careful because she didn't want to hurt the doctor's feelings about it. He, he didn't like his family too much either, but it isn't polite to say so. They were very dull, but they could have been interesting if they had a different frame of mind because they didn't necessarily lead uneventful lives. And there were certain things about them that, in retrospect, I can see are probably very interesting. For one thing, the Tibbetses family came to this country in 1638. Mm -hmm. That is very early indeed. Mm -hmm. And when my sister Mary was first married, or when, or I say when she was married uh, first, because she had only one marriage, um, her husband, who was interested in that sort of thing, said, why didn't she find out? what the family backgrounds were. And the DAR, they were in <laughs> Ithaca, the DAR has a library that looks up all these things. So Mary went to the DAR and the colonial dames. And she discovered that these people, who were very indifferent when she first appeared, began to get increasingly interested <laughs> when they discovered that she really was 
from a family that came in 1638. And the Tibbetses are mentioned in several of the genealogy books, including mm -hmm. one of the historical society. That's right. Um, Where did they live in Maine? Where did your father grow up? Well, he grew up in Palermo, Maine. Oh, okay. Yeah. He grew up, and uh, Palermo is a very dreary town. In uh, the Tibet, the first Tibbetses who came at that time were distenters. They were t small farmers and people who worked with their hands. My uncle was a stonemason, for example, mm -hmm. and that. And uh, they uh, they weren't fundamentalists like the people who rant and rave and the Pat Robertson and mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Falwell types. These traditional fundamentalists that started the whole, the dis dissenters were simply those Protestants who dissented from the Church of England and they dissented mainly from what they considered the decorative aspects of it, the mm -hmm. uh, ritual and so forth. They wanted it straight from the sh uh, shoulder, so to speak. Uh, they were mainly Congregationalists. And the Congregationalists, the Puritans who came in 1620 at Plymouth Rock were a special small sect group and uh, were not uh, lasting in intellectual, ch the church history on in mm -hmm. the intellectual side. The Congregationalists were the ones who came in 1630 to start the, uh, to found Boston and mm -hmm. Harvard and so forth and so forth. And they are people who came later, well actually all, most of the people who came to New England were pretty shrewd. That is when they came with them, they didn't have just scholars and clerics mm -hmm. and so forth. They also brought people who could, uh, could do something. Who could yes. do something. And uh, the dissenters, it could have been possible because that was the 1630s were a very tense period with the Archbishop Ward was enforcing the church, uh, the official church right to fees and they were, were punishing people who dissented and so forth. And a lot of dissenters uh, were unhappy and of course some of them found ways of going. There was a persistent report in rumor in the Tibbetts family. They mm -hmm. had all this was oral history oh, because yeah. they never wrote anything down. Uh, that the family had an attachment some way, some interest with Oliver Cromwell, mm -hmm. who of course was the great, a great man, uh, a bold bad man as the Cavaliers called him, but very, very able. And he was a Congregationalist and a dissenter. But he was a different class entirely. He came from a country family of considerable means and went to Cambridge and so forth. But he personally recruited and raised and trained the army, the, the Puritan army of dissenters, which uh, soundly defeated the Cavaliers eventually. So it is quite possible that some Tibbet standing in the ranks of the army, of course, foresaw and talked with mm -hmm. Oliver Cromwell, oh, yeah. because Cromwell was loyal to the army throughout his life. But uh, it doesn't mean that any connection wouldn't mean necessarily relatives, of course, as you say. But they were, the other tradition in the family was that the uh, Tibbets has fought in every war. They were very proud of that. They fought in the King Philip's Wars and the Indian Wars of the uh, uh, 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, they fought, uh, when we got to nearer to modern times, they fought in the Revolution and they fought in the Civil War. Uh, the doctor joined the Navy in the World War I and of mm -hmm. course Ashby in World War II. So that was the tradition they had. Uh, I think the doctor was the only one who ever served as an officer, though. Because mm -hmm. of, and one of the stories they told us, which Barry had heard of uh, for, through Mary, was that uh, one of the Tibbetses named Ichabod, they lived in uh, Pal the area between Palermo and Belfast in Waldo County, mm -hmm. and they all gravitated to Belfast and uh, they were seafaring mm -hmm. in interest, although they were primarily small farmers. Uh, Ichabod was on the streets of Belfast and he was impressed by British seamen, that is, by Br British uh, shore patrol people, <laughs> I guess, came on board and grabbed mm -hmm. uh, uh, streets and grabbed everyone they could find to put them uh, in the British Navy. Mm -hmm. And they put Ichabod to work on the ship, which he did with uh, very poor grace, and they 
got over nearer into New Brunswick and into the Bay of Fundy, and uh, he deserted. It was quite simple. The <laughs> ship uh, had a lot of people to look after and not many, and he just jumped overboard and swam ashore. All the Tibbetses could swim for some reason, <laughs> and irritated my mother because she couldn't. Mm -hmm. That's right. um, and uh, he got to shore and went on into the woods and headed west, which is back toward the United States. And uh, as he went along, he was dying of hunger. He could smell donuts cooking. Mm -hmm. And he reached a clearing, and there was a woman cooking in a a great pot, uh, an iron pot full of fat and mm -hmm. dipping and making mm -hmm. the donuts. And he roared at her, give me some of them donuts and grabbed them. I hope they burned him because of <laughs> it. Anyway, and um, ate some several and then he calmed down and gave restored order between the two of them and he went off and came home. But that was his contribution to the war for our independence. However, mm -hmm. it was legitimate because he was, uh, I say, in uh, in action. But why we thought the, the farm on which they lived in Palermo was very small and not very interesting. And they only had one horse, for example, literally a one horse. And uh, you could see once when I was standing with my mother up uh, in paradise by the garden and the doctor was using the scythe. And he was using it just as swiftly and as easily as if it had been a surgical tool. And I said, how well he sighs. And she said, well, that's because they only had one horse. Your grandfather would take the boys and put them in the fields and say, cut this all. So all the haying was done by hand. Wow. Everything was done by hand. And he could do anything. He didn't mm -hmm. like to do it, you understand, but he could do anything. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I mean, and my mother was very scornful of that because she said, think of it one horse because how inefficient and so forth. The uh, farm was small. It wasn't very uh, productive because Waldo County is just an average county mm -hmm. and grandfather was, uh, able, was quite uh, able as a stonemason, though he didn't do anything creative. He just put uh, names on gravestones and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, preferred to do that rather it had been a very large family. It had been nine or ten children. This is your father's generation. My father's family. Mm -hmm. um, they were, and uh, four or five of them had died of tuberculosis, which is very mm -hmm. common at that time. Uh, grandma, his, his mother was named, was maiden name was Turner, mm -hmm. and my mother said she was a small and vigorous and my mother said if there was any ambition in the family, she had it. Mm -hmm. But uh, they weren't ambitious. Uh, they were all intelligent in the sense they had no trouble in school at all, but they weren't much interested in anything. Uh, my father's older brother, Charles, Charles was the oldest, my father was next, and then there were four or five, as I say, mm -hmm. some of which, uh, and about half of them had died. Um, uh, Charles was interested in money. He had worked for a while in the state institution for the insane. Mm -hmm. And uh, even someone as insensitive as Charles had said it wasn't a very attractive job. Yeah. He'd given it up and come back to the farm. Uh, but he didn't like to work too well. My father's technique was to do go and do his share as fast as possible and then run off and read mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there was an old cousin who had said to my mother that when Ray was growing up, my father's name was Raymond, Ray, so they called yeah. him, the family called him Ray, his family. Uh, when Ray was growing up, they all said he wouldn't amount to anything because he might sit around reading all the time. He had no educational facilities except the one-room schoolhouse, which uh, you were supposed to go till you were 16, but uh, I think he was through by the time he was 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. and. Um, he wasn't terribly happy at home with the uh, all the hard work and not very comfortable living. If the mother said the house was small and damp, and uh, I well, I remember it as rather unattractive, mm -hmm. and uh, the fields and things weren't terribly productive. And, uh, so, uh, so he went off to become a hired boy. Mm -hmm. He worked very hard, and uh, that uh, you would. Then he went into Belfast where you, he thought he might get a chance to go to school there. And he was very lucky he f fell in with a man, a man whose name mother never knew. And uh, his wife 
who were dying. Man was interested in a doctor, being a doctor, and uh, they took him. They found he was excellent help because he was uh, intelligent and uh, very hardworking. And uh, he's very. My father was a very silent man, mm -hmm. and uh, he never made any noise or any difficulty. He had a his approach to life was exactly the same as someone like Herbert Hoover, <laughs> straightforward, old-fashioned mm -hmm. uh, Horatio Alger type of thing, uh, which of course makes excellent help if you get them on mm -hmm. your side. When the people with whom he was working moved to Bridgeton, mm -hmm. they took him with them, mm -hmm. and he went to Bridgeton Academy. They ended him there, which of course he loved, and it was the first real school he'd ever been in, and uh, he had no trouble with it. He was. Uh, he had a very good mind academically, and the doctor was a great reader. He'd read mm -hmm. everything. He was fond of reading medical books. He enjoyed that thing. He made up his mind he wanted to be a doctor. When he graduated from Bridgeton, he could get into Bowdoin College, and which had the main medical school there, mm -hmm. too. He could get in without any difficulty, but he had nothing to pay for. So he raised as much money as he could. The people from the people with whom he was staying mm -hmm. and the bank, they supported him at the bank, and from his brother Charles, who had mm -hmm. saved all his mm -hmm. wages from the uh, insane asylum. And this infuriated my mother that Charles charged him interest <laughs> because this would not be the way. Mm -hmm. And my father, in a way, always loved farming, but he was so glad he'd escaped from this mm -hmm. particular farm. But he particularly loved it because my mother's, the farm from which my mother came, was a completely different one. Yeah. And for the first time he went up there when, he was there, when they were engaged to be married, uh, he first went to the farm and he was just absolutely wounded. So this brings me to the Ashby side of the family because I've left my father. Uh, now he's entering Bowdoin Medical yeah. College okay. and medical, Maine Medical School and he's got a huge debt already, mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, my mother's family was much more interesting to us, of course, because my mother was much more interesting. Uh, my father had very quiet, silent uh, uh, personality, and sometimes he was very brusque, and uh, he had no bedside manner at all. <laughs> he didn't believe in telling the patients too much. He told, believed in telling them what to do, but he didn't mm -hmm. believe in telling them whether they were dying or not or anything. All this modern psychology. Oh, typical of his time, yeah, I would say. Typical of his time. Yeah. Say. Well, he said in some cases, mother said it was much the best thing to do because of, mm -hmm. um, he didn't have a very keen sense of humor. He, he appreciated other people's humor much more, but he never was very humorous mm -hmm. himself. He was a deadly mimic, though. Mm -hmm. He could come back from the telephone, and mother would say, who was that, dear? And he'd get a so-and-so with bow owls, and he'd get the <laughs> uh, accents oh, here, yeah. absolutely. And um, also he had a splendid singing voice. This is one thing that I really grudge. The Tibbetses all could sing, mm -hmm. and none of us could sing a note, absolutely. And um, he went right went in the privacy of the house. The doctor was frequently singing from morning till night. Mm -hmm. A little like Thomas Jefferson, they say he was <laughs> always either mumbling or singing mm -hmm. went around the place. They say, uh, and uh, but he never, of course, would sing in the choir because he didn't want it. Well, first of all, been impractical. He could never be in practice or uh, right on uh, call. Uh, with yeah. his, he was constantly on call. And, mm -hmm. But Mother, of course, had enough personality to make up for yeah. anything, though she couldn't sing. She was extremely, well, she was most, one of the most interesting people in the world. She had a very strong imagination, an excellent imagination, because it wasn't, a lot of people say they've got a good imagination, they really, it's pretty dull stuff, <laughs> but not Mother. And uh, she could, uh, it was entertaining, and she had a great sense of humor and she could see the humor instantly. She could see, she had a very quick, strong mind, and uh, she ran the house, absolutely. She regulated the doctor's comings and goings. He didn't realize it, but she'd <laughs> do it very subtly. And, uh, well, I've used this example before talking with people, but how she did it, for example, the doctor liked to get up and have breakfast early, which is fine. Um, at that time, men who worked in the mills below the railroad track 
walk to work usually because uh, not everybody had an automobile in say the early 1920s but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and mother man mill man might come in and say I want the doctor to change this bandage on my so forth and she'd say why don't you come in about a quarter past six in the morning you'll find him eating his breakfast and he'll play which is true and before you know it office hours were extended to <laughs> quarter past six something yeah. like that all this could do it, and it worked out very well. And she, when she took the telephone calls, as she did quite often, uh, she'd say, well, he'll be making his rounds. He'll be at so-and-so's by 9 o'clock. Why don't you see him there? Why don't you do this? And she'd do that end of it, too. So when he came home, he'd say, "With uh, I've seen such and such already. I've got the list. And so the, uh, she would keep the practice going. And... Um, she could always, uh, uh, practices are sometimes, uh, the patients can be, well, it's not as business for them. They take it more seriously than the doctor does sometimes. And uh, they miss my, dark, my father's bedside manner. And uh, it would all fade away when they got mother on the telephone. Mm -hmm. She could take care, she could fix it up when they wanted. And she'd tell them, oh, the doctor is not at all discouraged. And she was very, she was scrupulous about this. She never gave false hope or anything. She was very careful about what she said about it. But she could keep them, get them in the mood, and they wanted to uh, to cooperate rather than to raise a row or to waste time arguing, because arguing with my father was a great mistake, <laughs> but he never, just never listened. Yeah. He went ahead and did what he thought was right. And uh, fortunately, he was a very good doctor, efficient doctor, and uh, that was one of the things that uh, was great importance to mother. It's always interesting. My parents talked medicine back and forth between themselves all the time. The three of us, we, not one of us was interested. We mm. were interested in the uh, life around the, the medical. It's always interesting at a doctor's home. You come, you hear something it's going thump at two in the morning and you run downstairs and your father is on his hands and knees giving a hypodermic. Someone's had a heart attack and they've dragged him in off the street or mm -hmm. something. That sort of thing doesn't happen in the average home. It was quite, <laughs> quite interesting. Yeah. And uh, when the doctor went out late at night, he frequently took my brother with him. My brother loved that, mm -hmm. doing it, but he didn't want to have anything to do with what was going on in the medical field. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I say, my parents, both of them, thoroughly enjoyed medicine and talking about medicine all the time. And uh, my mother was the only person to whom my father ever spoke yeah. about anything. He never had another a partner, a doctor partner. No, never right? had they, anything. But yeah. they didn't tend to back then. They didn't was it? I mean, most of the doctors practiced by themselves. Yes, they did. There yeah. were, when I was growing up, there were uh, two other doctors, uh, Dr. Twaddle and Dr. White. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. White... Uh, his wife was almost the exact opposite of my mother. Mm -hmm. She hated the patients, and when they'd call and do, try to make the appointment to see the doctor, she'd scream at them that she wanted the doctor to take her to Berlin and buy something for a change. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so the patients pretty soon dropped away, one thing or another. I guess she was difficult in other ways. Dr. White uh, eventually died. Some people think he committed suicide. Oh, but Lord. That, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Twaddle was, of course, the son of the great Dr. John Twaddle, who had mm -hmm. been for 50 or 60 years had been the one man. In medical, yeah. And um, Dr. Twaddle had a wonderful personality, mm -hmm. easy and relaxed yeah. and laughing, and uh, yet very comforting and pleasant. Everybody loved Dr. Wid. He was physically not nearly as strong as my father. Mm -hmm. He couldn't go night and day, and he couldn't bear the, uh, couldn't uh, uh, relax in between periods of stress and strain. My father would come in and drop down on the couch and go to sleep immediately. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Nothing ever, he, he compartmentalized it. And, and um, so they both, but Dr. Wid, friend, Dr. Wid and the, my father worked well together because they uh, got mm -hmm. along, understood each other. And uh, so were they, were they friends or, yeah. you know, professional colleagues or how did that work? They were friends to the extent my father could be friendly with anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, they trusted each other. And, uh, they trusted uh, giving each other, letting each other take care of the patients right, back yeah. and forth and that sort of thing. Dr. White's wife was not as uh, uh, easy no. to get yeah, on. Right, yeah. But, uh, one thing to another. Well, how about if we go back to uh, starting to talk about your mother's 
family and then work up to how they met, how your yeah. parents met. Yeah, exactly. Okay, my mother's family, well, it was a great contrast from the, with the Tibbetses because, first of all, it was a different type of farm. Mm -hmm. uh, she, was from a, she came from Aroostook County. Aroostook County at that time, Aroostook County began to open up about in the 7, 18, just after the turn of the century, Aroostook mm -hmm. began to open, but it opened uh, at first slowly and then there was a rush. Um, and uh, her family here too was a very old family by Aroostook terms. Her ancestor, I'd have to uh, figure it, her, her grandfather, I guess, or her great-grandfather, had come, his name was Ferdinand Armstrong, mm -hmm. and he had come to Aroostook via Nova Scotia. He had stayed in Nova Scotia for some years, but it had gotten pretty very terribly crowded because Nova Scotia, of course, means New Scotland. Right, yeah. Scotland was in a period. <laughs> Emptying of, out. Yes. Yeah, the, the Scotland was in a period of uh, emigration right. and difficulties after the wars of the 18th, of the 17th century, and uh, it had, Nova Scotia had pretty much filled up. And Ferdinand Armstrong then, in some way, heard of opening in Rustic. You could go up the St. John River, the St. Croix River, and then I guess mm -hmm. up the Rustic River and go on up. And uh, he and his family came up the uh, river and settled near, right near the border in between Canada and the United mm -hmm. States. This would have been about seven, uh, 18, 15 or 16. But anyway, in 1822, they had a daughter, Catherine, mm -hmm. spelled with a C, mm -hmm. but pronounced Catherine. Mm -hmm. That's right. And Catherine, born in 1822, for years it was this Ashby family spoke of her as the first white child in Aroostook mm -hmm. County. And finally someone mentioned, well, certainly there must have been French children <laughs> but living up above, there, up in Arcadia, which mm -hmm. is up where, uh, Mad near Madawaska and all that yeah. area up to the north. Of course, it was filled with white children. They just, well, the English-speaking yeah. oh, white yeah. children, that's, of course, what they, what they rustic were, people, yeah. was, was important to them. Uh, Catherine, is it? But she never went to school. There were no schools. Mm -hmm. And um, poor thing was illiterate all her life. But this is where the children, of course, discovered that she didn't like to be reminded of it. She mm -hmm. used the old business of a peddler came that I forgot my spectacles. Oh, you yes, you yes. read the label or something. Her, her family, the Armstrongs, took up a very good-sized tract of land. I don't know how the government was running it at that time, but you could pick up a lot of land for yeah. a small price. Right practically on the border. In 1827, the British authorities came storming in and said they had not paid their taxes. And they said they had to pay their taxes. They'd gone right down to the uh, town office in Presque Isle mm -hmm. and done it. And the British said, that belongs to us. This was the war, eventually, but part of oh, yeah. This was one of the Cassai Valley of, mm -hmm. the, of that war, the Aroostook War. Right. And uh, the Armstrongs are mentioned in a book called Ties of Blood, which is a mm -hmm. historical account of the the War of 18, mm -hmm. uh, approximately 1837 to 1842. Mm -hmm. uh, and this land that was under, dis, 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 that was questioned and disputed about was listed separately and listed separately for many years until eventually the original owner died off and uh, Ferdinand's land was listed way past the Civil mm -hmm. War. He was still alive and going mm -hmm. strong. In the, well, among the British soldiers that were there, James Ashby, mm -hmm. he came from Derbyshire. He had been a small farmer in uh, England, and in England a small farmer could be a very small farm indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, he could read and write, but I don't know how much his education went beyond then, but he was a... Uh, 
non-commissioned officer, corporal, I think, so he must have been able to read and write and mm -hmm. go beyond uh, and take care of some paper with bookwork and so forth like that. When the war was finally settled in 1842, Daniel Webster, so forth, well, they signed the treaty and all going, and uh, the British began to get ready to withdraw. James Ashby, along with some of his colleagues, deserted, mm -hmm. and they came across the river. I don't know how this, how they made it, probably with a rowboat. Mm -hmm. I hate to think of anybody swimming in, <laughs> up in that area of the neck of the woods. And uh, he hunted for work immediately and found work almost immediately on the Armstrong farm. Oh, okay. And after some time, he and Catherine were married. Oh, wow. And they were given um, the land. The land obviously came from the Armstrongs, because I've gone through that book about the common blood and so oh, forth, I and see. who had the... And the Armstrongs were always listed as owners long after James mm -hmm. and Catherine were, had taken yeah. over. And they, in 1850, they built a house, which is this house. Mm -hmm. oh. This house I took with my own fair hands. Uh -huh. the, uh, that's right. Oh, yeah, it's still that's right. going strong, apparently. Yes. Yeah. And oh, what, yes, what town is this in? I, I, we didn't mention this that. This is in Fort Fairfield. Fort Fairfield, okay. Because uh, all of this, uh, after 1827, at some point, a fort was built. Mm -hmm. And the land itself is only two or three miles from the from border, the border yeah. and it's easy that you can see that it could have been this way. And they were married in 1850. Oh, oh my word. And this is a t was taken from an old tin type. And, oh, and that, sure. From, yeah. That is James rather wisp. Now this that's, is... That's uh, the, the James, the British James, soldier. This is Catherine. Catherine. Looks yeah. very much like my aunt now. Uh -huh. And this is W.T., the oldest child. Oh, okay, yeah. W.T. was my mother's father. Oh, okay, all right. And this is, you see, this yeah. is the, the Ashby's and I eventually became two branches. Mm -hmm. But that's only after they were grown up because mm -hmm. W.T. was the first child they born in 1851 and they... All of the Ashby's nine children, eight of them lived to be adults, which oh, shows heavens. that the family yeah. was pretty healthy. Yes, and, yeah. And uh, the same in my mother's family. There's say no tuberculosis around here, you know, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh, now, Catherine was Ferdinand Armstrong's child. He had married Mary Parks. Mm -hmm. They did. The people who assembled this uh, did it sort of backward. They should have started up here this way. <laughs> yeah. Mary Parks, that's right. Mm -hmm. These were the parents of Catherine Armstrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Mary Parks' parents include a man named Jonathan Parks and Hannah Bradley. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Parks was just an ordinary citizen. Hannah Bradley mm -hmm. was the daughter of a man named John Bradley and the Princess Crooked Knife. Oh, so that's where the Native the, American connection come right. in. That's right, Native yes. American. Now, John Bradley uh -huh. had been in the expedition from Arnold that Arnold took to oh Quebec, my goodness, and yeah. he had been captured by the Ottawa Indians mm -hmm. and had been with them for 15 or 20 years. And in the course of it, he had married the Princess Crooked Knife. Okay. Whether she really was a princess or whether they, <laughs> yeah. that was, might have been some of the Ashby sarcasm about uh -huh. them. And they had Hannah Bradley, who was Yes, Jonathan I can see. Pump, you're sort you of see we're moving up the, the right. chain here. This, yeah. this, but this, but, and Hannah Bradley and Princess Crooked Knife, and that was, uh, yeah. they became, yeah. well, they married Jonathan Fox, who went on up. Yes. Then, anyway, this adds up to uh, approximately, mother would have been approximately 132nd Indian <laughs> if this was a, but, uh, yeah. and uh, George Ashby, her, uncle, who was one of these uncles who, see, her father was at the top of the list yes, in 1851. Right. She was born in 1884. Okay. And, with, and there were three children older than she, so they were all married at about the age of 18 and 19. Right. WT, that's right. And George was one of these uncles who was only about 10 years older than his niece and nephew. Right. That's right. Yeah. So More they of a used, contemporary. Yeah, yeah. And they used to have a great deal of back and forth thing in one thing mm -hmm. and another and joking all about the Princess Crooked Knife and he un and oh, I'm yeah. one six he'd say I'm one sixteenth Indian and you're nothing but one thirty <laughs> oh, yeah. that. yeah. right. But 
course, it's all very interesting. The prince, I don't know even what tribe, well, I guess Princess Crooked Knife would have come in Ottawa from the Ottawa Indians, mm -hmm. the same as John Bradley. Mm -hmm. in, so, this is. Now, did all of the of your mother's relatives pretty much live in that area? You yes, know, they like did. Her cousins and my, other people. My mother's father, must who say, must have married very young. He married a girl named Ada Ward, mm -hmm. and he and Ada Ward, they took up and they got quite a lot of land. Mm -hmm. uh, I think his grandfather Ferdinand may have helped him too, because Ferdinand still. Not. But they were in, in Presque Isle. Presque Isle, oh, okay, Port right. Fairfield, and Caribou are mm -hmm. equidistant the perfect triangle. Mm -hmm. And they were the same distant from every town, but they were in the Presque Isle corner, whereas the oh, okay. original Ashby were in the Fort Fairfield corner. That's right. Uh, W.T. and Ada and some oxen cleared a good deal mm -hmm. of the land. They had uh, beautiful big fields. He had a woods right on his own property so he could get his own wood. And, uh, and I remember Mary, my sister Mary and I were standing looking down over the field and a deer came out of the potato and went right over the oh. air fence, you know, into his woods and things. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no wonder they ate venison all the time, but this mm -hmm. way. And uh, they, Ada Ward, whom he married, was somewhat beneath him socially, that mm -hmm. is, they were all, everybody was always conscious of the fact the Ashby's were an important family. Mm -hmm. She, the Wards lived in the swamp, mm -hmm. and uh, I once read in a book, uh, I was reading in England, that the, the Wards were one of the great Tinker families of Ireland. The Tinkers, oh, you know, were yeah. like gypsies, only yeah. there were gypsies. Yeah. They, did, they went around, lived in caravans, and they repaired your pots and pans, and they mm -hmm. never did any regular work. But unlike the gypsies, they didn't have a reputation for stealing, which is good. <laughs> and I don't know whether they were any good with pots and pans. But anyway, the wards, uh, and I don't know if these wards were tinkers. Mother said they were all very uh, uh, pleasant, but they knew absolutely nothing about it. You said, where would you come from? They knew their father, period. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, what they brought into the family, apart from a good sense of humor and uh, the capacity for enjoying life, they were tall. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was about five foot ten, and W. T. was about five foot nine or ten. My brother was six foot four. Yeah. And um, my cousins in Aristoc, my cousin Dudley, my cousin Jimmy, all are all so tall. Well, those were the wards. Oh. Okay. And Graham said she always, when she saw the grandchildren, she saw those great long legs. Those were her her brothers. Mm -hmm. Uh, they didn't want to have anything to, the wards didn't want to have anything to do with potatoes. They didn't want to work for anybody, the hired man. They liked to hunt and fish. Mm -hmm. And they hunted and fished a great deal. Occasionally they'd do an odd job for you. Uh, the one that always impressed us most as children, we didn't see him, but we heard about him, was Graham's brother, Alonzo. Alonzo had an argument with his mother and he became very angry, and she had knit him a pair of socks, and he grabbed them from her hand and sat down on the chopping block and ate them. <laughs> a great yeah. big heavy wool socks. And Graham would always say, we never saw anything like it. She says, he ate them socks. <laughs> said, and it must have been terribly uncomfortable. I've thought about it for oh. years. Because, <laughs> but he ate them right down, and that was the end of the argument. Oh, my uh, goodness. And we yeah. never heard any of the aftermath, which was probably mm -hmm. just as well. But that's... Uh, Oh. But they, as I say, they were strong-minded and strong-willed. And Graham had a good sense of humor. She was very generous, very kind, very, mm -hmm. very kind. I, you could see my mother and Graham very easily. And to the neighbors that lived across the road and up the way a little bit there was a family named the Todds, and they were just oh, okay. as just as opposite from the Ashbys. Mm -hmm. The Ashby family had four or five great big horses. It had a, a building, separate building for the pigs. It had a separate building for the sheep. There were two or three potato houses. There was a big, big barn. There were places where you kept grain. Uh, you had cats to keep the mice down mm -hmm. keep in this situation. And uh, you had uh, always, there was a kitchen garden by the, right near the house for Graham to work in, but there were other gardens where you had potatoes and oats and various things that they grew. 
And uh, all of this was uh, worked on constantly. Let's keep going. Keep on, keep on going. Uh, and everybody used to say there was a great deal. Well, the poor Todds. Todds had no land to speak of except the swamp, which is useless mm -hmm. uh, for practical purposes. And uh, the Todds had children about the same age as the Ashby children. Of course, in the country, you'd play together mm -hmm. all the time. And the one who was mother's age, unfortunately, was Leander, was the least uh, likable of the whole lot. Harry they were, was acceptable, and Freeman, the baby, was all right, but not Leander and Lucy. They were the ones that were, and they were te great teases. And, uh, well, uh, and frequently, well, no, not frequently, but say every two or three months, Mrs. Todd would appear to visit my mother, grandmother, in the kitchen, and she'd have a dish pan or a saucepan with her, and she'd say, Ada, I just ain't got nothing left to eat. Mm. And, I, and my mother, Graham, would up and she'd say, Pearl, get this, and get Ruby, Nellie, or children, mm -hmm. all the girls. And, and they'd load up Mrs. Todd, and she'd start back, and W.T. would say, here I am, and you're feeding the poor, what do you think you are, loaves and fishes? <laughs> and and um, She'd say, Graham would say, I don't care, I don't want to see hungry children. He'd say, well, that's all right. Of course, he just liked to be mm -hmm. making it. Um, old Dan Todd, the man of the house, used to call himself a preacher. He'd go around preaching, mm -hmm. and um, he was very critical of W.T., who was a free thinker. Uh, there was no regular church, organized church, in this whole country area. And there isn't to this day, I'm fascinated when I drive mm -hmm. through, there's the Grange Hall where they have dances, but there's no, there's no church. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, nobody in, our, the wards of course weren't religious, and my grandmother wasn't religious. Uh, we all loved Graham, she was uh, very, uh, to say kind and warm and generous, and she had a great sense of humor, and she had uh, all sorts of little poems and things that they mm -hmm. could recite. She uh, wrote, my sister wrote one down, and uh, if I've got to be able to find it somewhere, mm -hmm. somehow, yeah. or very well if I won't, it began, Old Thomas Cat, he had no wife. He lived a wild and wicked life. <laughs> Cards, tobacco, pipe, and gin, when one was out, the other was in. <laughs> Often at night he'd go with stealing and dark with all these crimes concealing. And then she'd go and say, well, that sort of thing, which we all love. But she yeah. had to say a great sense of humor. And she uh, was, and it's not just our branch of the family, everybody to say was very fond of, of Graham. And uh, she lived uh, up until about 19, 38 or 39. Oh, so you all experienced yes. having we grandparents. all experienced. Yeah. Uh, W.T. died in 1920. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't remember him. I was born in 1914. Right. I do remember yeah. Graham very warmly. And all of us, uh, my Uncle Fred's children and my Uncle mm -hmm. Aunt Ruby's children. And we Did all, you go up to Aristic yes, County as children? To, that was part of the whole thing was we all went to always... Um, to see grow as long as Graham was alive. I mean, like like in the summer or something. In the summer, oh, well, in the summer, oh, not in the winter. No, no, right. I would hope not. But. When we first started, I can remember the early 1920s. Uh, I must have been three or four. We had pup tents. It was very exciting, Ashby, and the doctor ran around putting up pup tents, and Mary and I shared one, the doctor and mother shared one, Ashby had oh. one all to himself, mm -hmm. let's say, and you camped because it was a two-day trip. And then it got oh. to be a one-day trip. Mother got us up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and then we'd make it till about... The, <laughs> so you and drive, the, and the, you drive up Now there. it's about a six-and-a-half-hour yeah. trip, to say, and all the road. And the roads used to be awful, of course. Oh, yeah. And that's right. And we knew... Uh, we had... Uh, our cousins, our main cousins, were Uncle Fred's children. W.T. ran the farm up until about early 20th century. And he was getting old. He, he worked very hard himself, mm -hmm. and people got to died more oh, earlier. Yeah. That's right. And he gave up running the farm, and he turned it over to my uncle Fred. Mm -hmm. My uncle Frank, for some reason, they quarreled with him. The family record isn't very good on yeah. this sort of thing. But Uncle Frank, the oldest boy, had just taken off and uh, set up and uh, started a 
working for someone else as a patent one. Mm -hmm. But Uncle Fred had the farm, and Uncle Fred had married a very pleasant Irish girl named Mertie Haley, and uh, she related to Susan Collins. Oh, no so, kidding. So All this right. branch of my relatives <laughs> was still Suspect, uh, yes. strong Republicans. They're very, yeah. very proud of Susan Collins, yeah. as I say. To say. And, uh, uh, the Haley's, as I say, were, right. but they were very good, and she was uh, very pleasant and nice. Unfortunately, she died of meningitis sometime in the early 30s, mm -hmm. and uh, Uncle Fred, well, Graham was not well by that time. She'd broken her hip, mm -hmm. and uh, the doctors in Aristic, according to my father, were all incompetent. He did, he'd known this particular doctor, and he'd been in his class at medical school, and oh. he said he was particularly incompetent. But uh, none of them, I think, was very good. <laughs> and uh, she hadn't, so they had, she just laid as, a, as an invalid, oh. and it was very, but she was very good. She was, uh, oh, she was very, I won't say stoic, but she was very well, sensible, yeah. very sensible. You could be very proud of her as well. And uh, they, they had two or three very good hired girls, and but that took care of it. And this went on quite well for three or four years, and then Uncle Fred married again, and heaven's all the tales about the evil stepmother and oh, things. No. It just is a disaster if you mm. get this sort of thing. And uh, uh, she didn't, uh, they didn't change Graham's treatment. Uncle Fred would not, do it, but he was, uh, he, he man is powerless against a and yeah. difficult and wife and so forth. And one way or another, all the other people, and my mother and Aunt Nell didn't want to go back, if you say. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, just went through. Well, eventually, after my father died, um, which was in 1958, there had been a period of 10 or 12 years there when Uncle Fred had had this in the process of uh, going on. My mother and Aunt Nell decided they had to go back and see, they wanted to see their sister and her cousins, all this sort of thing. Graham had died, to say, mm, about 1938, yeah. one thing or another. Um, so my mother, my mother had learned to drive mm -hmm. with difficulty. Mm -hmm. And so she, they worked it out, they took the map and they would go only back roads. And she worked out a back road route to a, a, a rustic mm. that she followed up through Dover Foxcroft. Oh, yeah. and, and she yeah. now, now went, and they did this for several years, and they were so proud of themselves, and it worked very well, and they just kept up the contact. Then after that, uh, both of them had died, and uh, eventually my, I went back up with my cousins about 1990, and right. I hadn't seen them uh, for... 40 or 50 mm -hmm. years, and, and uh, then I went back with the family reunion, and then I've been back one other time with another cousin. Mm -hmm. um, the, how did they be, the, uh, the farm, as I say, after my mother went, got through with the elementary, the one-room schoolhouse, right. which of course she had loved, mm -hmm. and they had all, all the Ashby's had done well in school, but she was particularly fond of it. Mm -hmm. Um, the question is what to do because she obviously wasn't going to go out and work as a hired girl or anything mm -hmm. like that. And she uh, was able to go in, in town. W.T. said, well, I'll buy pay if you want to board and go to high school. High school was this is uh, Presque Isle. in Presque Isle. Yeah. And the high school was in operation and it had not been in operation for many years. Oh. I mean, they, well, they hadn't had a high school mm -hmm. just for some time. And uh, none of the other Ashby's had gone. She was the first one in the, her family to go to high school and graduate, and she mm -hmm. lo loved it. And uh, my Aunt Nell had not gone to high school, but she, my sis mother's older sister, mm -hmm. and, and very, she was very efficient, very kind mm -hmm. of good. She had taught us, gotten hold of an old typewriter and taught herself to teach. She said, decided mm -hmm. that the century, the 20th mm -hmm. century was going to be the century mm -hmm. that women were liberated, she said, and would be able to do something. Mm -hmm. So she taught herself to type, and she got jobs around Presque Isle for a while, typing for people and typing up things uh, for W.T. And um, W.T. had written, written, after he retired, a history of Aristic, which mm -hmm. she and Aunt Ruby shared typing. and. Then Aunt Nell got some more money, W.T. gave her some more money, and she went to Portland. She had read about Portland as having 
jobs and various things. Mm -hmm. And she got a job in a, a wholesale house where, which uh, bought goods and gave them to all the peddlers and the small stores mm -hmm. all, all over. She knew you could look at the map and tell you the name of the dry goods <laughs> uh, man, uh -huh. man in every single town. It's, it's a, and she was very efficient, very quick and something, and reading the Portland paper, which she did in Portland, and enjoying all these benefits of civilization. And she saw that the main general hospital was going to start a nursing school. Wow. And so she wrote to my mother, of course, and got the papers and went around to see them and went in to see them and asked the pertinent questions about it. it was the, to go to nursing school, you didn't need much money because they paid the bills yeah. and things. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I don't know whether they do it now, but they did that. And uh, mother graduated from Presque Isle in 1904 and then went immediately into nursing school. She got this mm -hmm. through Aunt, with Aunt Nell's help. And that would have been in, in Portland or Augusta? In, or in Portland. Portland. In Portland. Yeah. She went to the main general hospital, okay. which was the biggest and best hospital and had the mm -hmm. biggest and best uh, interning and nursing. Mm -hmm. It's where my father interned. Oh, okay. It was like West Point. If you were head of the class, they gave you a choice of place to, in, to intern. <laughs> yeah. so, well, that's the way she... Uh, but he was not there at that time. He'd gone off into practice, and he had married a girl, and a marriage didn't last. Okay. Because yeah. his disposition, she couldn't cope with it. Mm -hmm. Also, he didn't make enough money. Mm -hmm. and, and so that... But so he was divorced, and... Uh, he uh, had had trouble with his lung. lung. He had not, was not tubercular, but he had a weak lung mm -hmm. or something. And uh, the fog and so forth on the coast was difficult. And mm -hmm. a man at the coast said, I see John Sturdivant is selling his practice. It's up in the mountains, a town called Bethel. Uh -huh. So the doctors had to buy the practice, which was more debt. Yeah. And to buy the house, which also was more debt. And the, the house, the one, the one that they've always lived in. Yeah, yeah. the one we've always lived in. He had to pay $3,000 for it. Mother mm -hmm. said, well, we got our money's worth on it. <laughs> yeah, we, I would we say. We certainly yeah. lived into it. But my mother, in the meantime, came, and she got graduated from nursing in mm -hmm. the class of 1909. And she did very well indeed. She went. They sent her to Boston, where she worked with... Harvey Cushing, the brain yeah. man. She was in the operating room there, and she was uh, very uh, quick. I didn't know that. Very quick and keen and devoted and uh, uh, intelligent and uh, very good in the lo good in the locker room, as they say about mm -hmm. baseball players. She was good with the other nurses yeah. in the training business like that. And she worked there, and then she came back to uh, Portland and worked in the main general. But then she did what. They could send nurses out if you were Mr. King in Kingfield, the great mm -hmm. uh, man. He was very sick, and they wanted a good nurse. Oh, and you, yes. they sent one up, and mm -hmm. they paid. It was wealthy families did this because they had to pay all the expenses on everything right. like that. And Miss Annie Fry in Bethel, who lives on, lived in the house on Broad Street. It's uh, it's sort of a mud brown color with. Uh, it's near the... The doctor, the one that Dr. Young was in. Yeah, oh, yes, Dr. yes, Young, Reish, yeah. Brown, that's yes, right. yeah. That's where Annie Fry lived. Yeah. Annie Fry was the daughter of Richard Fry, who was one of the Fry's of Fryburg. Right, okay, yeah. Bethel's great, so many, great uh, history. That, and the Fry's uh, were, of course, well-to-do and could pay all this. And her mother came and uh, stayed with Annie Fry, and that's where she learned a great deal about Bethel. I should say so. Annie yeah. Fry much enjoyed having this keen young woman who was interested. Mm -hmm. in the uh -huh. But she also, to say, that's where she met the, met the doctor. Oh, of course. Yeah. In 19, she came in 1912. They were married in 1913. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ashby was born in Did she come sort of expecting that it was going to be a long, uh, you know, like her, her stay with Miss Fry was going to be a long stay or not? She knew it might be quite a long stay. On the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, Miss Fry was surviving, which made it a happy stay. Oh, yes. And she uh, stayed with Miss Fry for a while, and then she went down and lived in the Moses Mason house, which mm -hmm. was then uh, the Durrells, Ada oh, Durrell. Okay. And uh, she was always very fond of Ada Durrell, though she said she was, she said Ada's as simple as a hen, yeah. which is always... <laughs> I think that might be on the tape that I made a few years ago with her. <laughs> but 
they, and there she stayed with, with, with her, the same Mary, the doctor. Mm -hmm. right. And then uh, in, uh, in her, one of her diaries, there was some reference to it. She made, uh, something she said, I guess it's said my wedding anniversary, she said, I got married and the years have flown, just flown. Yeah, since then. yeah. Well, they were very, very busy. Mm -hmm. And she was the busiest person in it. She tended the office. Remember, mm -hmm. everything in the office had to be washed and sterilized oh, yeah. you know, all the time. All the, and uh, she tended the office, uh, that side of the office, and then she tended the question of uh, feeling the patients and how to do it. And she had three of us and uh, the housework. She never liked to hire girls. She had hired girls occasionally, but she never liked having them around if she could avoid it. Because Mother mm -hmm. worked at the rate of speed with which she worked always uh, fascinated me, and mm -hmm. it still does the more I think about it. But, uh, she could, uh, and very efficient, but just high, uh, she had high energy. Right, and, yeah. And, and it went, uh, and uh, went very, uh, and she, um, I'll tell you, she was just very, very busy. She loved Bethel. She, uh, uh, she had the flowers, the garden, the things we mm -hmm. liked to do, all of them are here. Uh, she was, uh, she liked the, a settled village side of it, that is, things like the library and the church yeah, and things. Yeah. None of it had been available in Green Ridge. She loved Aristic. They all loved Aristic, but they couldn't wait to get, escape and get out where you could get to a library or get to do things. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, my grandfather, W.T., uh, mother wrote in to, to Aunt Nell and said, you know, W.T. was a great, fine mind, but a vile disposition. Mm -hmm. And I think that his disposition, which was uh, notorious, uh, you get frustration in a way, because he he knew he was very bright, but uh, not a genius or anything, just mm -hmm. but, but you have no one to talk to much except the hired man or the people right. like the Todds, or your family is bright and lively, but they're always it's difficult, children are difficult up to a certain point. Well, then and, they leave you. That's right. <laughs> and then they're going to leave you, yeah. and one thing and another, all of these things. And uh, I looked, had a chance to look very briefly at the type manuscript of his complete history of, of Aristic. Because mm -hmm. my sister Mary and I had talked about, you know, doing something. What could we do? And I looked through it, uh, it, it's in the property of one of the cousins who'd done the typing. Oh, the so it never was published. Then. Never has been published. Oh, no. But it, it could be published. What you'd have to do would be a lot of editing because he uh, leaned on, of course, the well-published sources, the history of, right. of, of, yeah. of Maine. Uh, but then they'd, a lot of it was his own living. He, he'd been... A, worked on virgin forests and all mm -hmm. of these things, making shingles and on, on mm -hmm. the, all of these in various camps and how yeah. rustic was settled. And you get a sense of frustration in all of the business about W.T. because the family was fascinated by him and at the same time they didn't like his disposition and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that bothered the various things about it and he, he got very quarrelsome and difficult at times, one thing or another. Uh, you sense this frustration that here was a man, he, he didn't have the tools to do anything. He had never had anything except the one-room schoolhouse. He spoke correctly and he wrote correctly. And all of them, except Graham, when she got excited, spoke correctly. And he was mm -hmm. very careful about that. Because the one-room schoolhouse teaches you correct grammar and so right. on. But it doesn't teach you all the things you need to know about uh, using original sources. And the original oh, sources are what are interesting. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. say none of the mechanics of scholarship or working about he, do, he just didn't have any tools, and he probably didn't have anybody much to talk with about it. And you know you need the stimulus of a, another brain always. Yeah. It's a, huh. I learned at an early age when I was uh, working in the State Department, never say when someone says, you, I've got an idea or something, you never say I'm finished with it, to, forget it. Just stop and listen to the idea, yeah. because it might be something that uh, it really would to help mm -hmm. you. Know. And, they say you sense this frustration about the whole thing that mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to talk about Aristic. He knew what Aristic needed leadership, which they didn't have. They were being mm -hmm. pushed around by everybody, and they are to this day, you know. Oh, the yeah. uh, poor fools, they'll uh, get the potatoes sold and uh, 
go into a, get a drink and then there's a guy there waiting to play cards or something yeah. and the next thing they're all, they're just mm -hmm. like people out of a storybook about mm -hmm. this and uh, very trusting and uh, uh, foolish uh, about that and well, uh, everybody's leaving that's the mm -hmm. you know really yeah. it's it's a they, really losing population yeah. they don't have any leaders they don't yeah. have a the um, politicians don't pay much attention to Aristic. What good does it do them? Because no matter who's governor, he's not going to be interested in a place that's uh, beyond a certain point. Yeah. Well, they all say they're interested. In, uh, and uh, I yearn to tell them that I don't think the present political leaders really much care about Aristic any more than anybody else. They're well, it would be interesting in this congressional race, just a little diversion here, which we can edit out later, that uh, the guy who's running against Mike Mishu was head of that Loring Redevelopment Authority oh, that, yeah. you know, yeah. did over the base up yeah. there. Yeah. So I'm sure he's going to try to make quite a thing oh, yeah. of that, which will be interesting. Oh, but yeah. anyway. Well, they all need jobs. They all need things. But so the, you, know, you and Mary talked about trying to do something with this we book. We talked about it. We talked, but first of all, we both were busy because yes, uh, yeah. uh, she, had, she was the working for the Ithaca Press and the Cornell oh, University yeah. Press, and she was busy all the time editing. Mary was a wonderful editor, mm -hmm. and one of the great things I mourn about her death, which yeah. I mourn a great deal, was that she was working on Frances Perkins' memoirs, and, oh, uh, and oh, uh, they were just stopped when she stopped, because yeah. it, was, it was very difficult. She, Frances Perkins was at Cornell, was she yeah, at she was, the, but the labor been, school or something? Was, well, she had been, but she, mainly she was retired and yeah. was writing about her years with the Roosevelt administration, yes, right. when Mary was writing for but I was working, Mary was working, we didn't have the time or the money. What you do, if you gave me a year with mm -hmm. no extra things to do, and it would be very simple to go to University of Maine, go to the University of Prescott, and get to look at the sources and things, and, yeah. and work in it, yeah. and then I'd have to deal with all my relatives, <laughs> all, of whom, all of whom have ideas. And the other thing is the manuscript is exactly, well, W.T. had a lot of grandchildren. I mean, the manuscripts in the hands of others. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. That who would and everyone would have ideas. Oh, of course. And, um, yeah. The so the I say it would be hard. And then of course, uh, by the time I had the time, which yeah. theoretically I'm too old to do it. You you lose your drives. Well, yeah. And things get yeah. to be uh, uh, get. I won't say that. Uh, it just gets you so slow. So slow. It's a, well, it's also a big project that's up in Arusta County, and it's you're up, here, which exactly is, uh, you know, and, and, that's, and, and dealing with all the yeah. relatives and so forth. I have, uh, they have the Arusta Historical Society published uh, a history of Arusta County, which mm -hmm. I have, and I have the uh, book on the war of, of right. the Arusta oh, yeah. War and various things. But there are tons of things which I need to study yeah. and. Uh, would would need to study and uh, and then I uh, say it's uh, just not convenient no. at all to do. But back to your mother, she wrote a book as I remember. Yeah, my now, mother how, wrote. How did that come about? My mother wrote a book. Oh, she was determined to write about Aristic, and she wanted to write a book. And she had read. The, she was a busy doctor's wife, but other people like Mary Roberts Reinhardt had been busy doctor's wives. Mm -hmm. So she'd get up at four in the morning and uh -huh. work and uh, write it. It's a good book, Kathy. Uh, we treasure the copies in the family because right. they get steer stolen or people yeah. just don't return them one thing or yeah. another. And that sort of thing. Uh, and I'd be glad to lend them to you since you're a safe bet. And yeah, I, th I, think, I uh, think that I might have one though. I, I'm i trying to remember that and I'll go and look but uh, I it's one of the wonders of the internet is you know you can find books That's like that on the internet yeah. and that I did at one point was, was focused on acquiring some of the Bethel yeah. books well, and I might have, have gotten that one but um, well, or you know she yeah. or you might have given me one 20 yeah. years ago <laughs> but um, yeah. but now so she, she would have done that when you all were still in the household or, or in I later was, years? I was in the household partly. Uh, Mary was at college and then I went uh -huh. away to college and came back and Mary and I read it. I would have, uh, I objected to the style more because uh, not of not a land under heaven. That is just she, very straightforward. Yes. But then she has another manuscript which uh, she had done which was on her nursing days. Uh, and it was very... Um, 
a 19th and early 20th century prudishness. Oh, uh -huh. Land of the Heavens, I have the clippings. That's the one that I, I remember. I have clippings of two or three uh, reviews, uh -huh. and they say it's a good book, but then they comment on the fact that Mrs. Tibbetts doesn't deal with the realities of the of some of the re less pleasant realities of colonial life. Oh, I she see. never touched on alcohol or anything uh, like that. Well, no, no, you know no, that they yeah, all yeah. drank like fish. Yeah. But, uh, and and uh, yeah. how did it come to be published? Well, she uh, interviewed him, talked with a man in the Stephen Day Press. This was in the height of the Depression, and mm -hmm. I mean the Depression was very difficult everywhere. Yeah. Even with us, mm -hmm. we weren't as hard up as many people, I can say. Uh, my father's our livelihood, we, we were very well off by many. Yes. That is, I can't think of more than the three other families in town that knew from the moment they stepped out of the cradle that they were going to college. Right. And yeah. that take it for granted. But this, uh, on the other hand, uh, Mother had ran the house very thriftily, and we all, uh, we had to, she had to get the doctor's debt paid off. Mm -hmm. He had married, as I say, it was unfortunate. But of course, when he got the divorce, and uh, was mutual agreement. He had to pay. The, yes. the, the, so you had. Did he have any children with with his? Uh, did he have children from his first marriage? Yes, he had children from his first marriage. So, oh yeah. He you know, so, so you had his college debts, mm. uh, which were his, and medical school debts. You see, added on to that. Yeah. And then all the other question of uh, his alimony to yeah. pay off, because uh, Mr. Park who was. Uh, excellent lawyer, said to my father, why don't you negotiate a lump sum settlement and get this for me? And that was uh, really worked out better. Mm -hmm. He wants it rather than going through other things because she wasn't too pleasant about it at all. And uh, mother, as I say, and then the question of saving to get us to college. Mother mm -hmm. was very conscious of that coming from a family in which everybody wanted to be educated, but it wasn't easy to yeah, say this, yeah. get the three of us. And for a period of 10 years, there was never a year that there wasn't at least one of us in college, and sometimes oh, two. Yeah. Ashby was a senior when Mary was a freshman. Mary was a senior when I was a right. freshman, right through from go right oh, through. Oh yeah, from, you know all about <laughs> it. Yes, uh, yes. But yes. you have just two. Just two, though. Uh, yeah. uh, so all of this, uh, mother, the economy, e economies, mm. and so forth. She was kept. Uh, we had a very relatively Spartan. Uh, mm -hmm. Upbringing, but we didn't mind. The house was very shabby, and who cares? Yeah. Doesn't tell you there's one thing about being the doctor's child. You have a certain standing. I mean, uh, nobody's going to complain if your house is shabby because yeah. the doctors are important. But but going yeah. getting through the depression, at least you were. Yeah, but you knew the, you. Yeah, you well, in the depression, income. mother went to see the man from the Stephen Day mm -hmm. Press wanted very much to publish it. He said, and uh, he did publish it and all, and um, he sold enough to cover the cost of the publication and one thing or another. He didn't have enough to bring out a second edition. But, yeah. uh, and uh, so it was, Mother had the satisfaction of seeing, but of course she didn't make any money with it. No, did um, did it generate much hysteria around Bethel and no, excitement it or anything? No, it generated a great deal of interest. Everybody had a copy at yes. the time. Oh, yeah. And uh, everybody was interested. Nobody knew much about Aristic. Uh, no, and no. it's just as remote here as if it were in uh, Patagonia. But the, um, it, but she, she was satisfied to get it, to see it done, and uh, oh, it was yeah. terrible. It was very much interested, interest of course in a rustic, and she was, went up when we went up. Uh, Mary drove her mother and me up because uh, the doctor was busy. To she gave mother was uh, invited to speak at the uh, oh. range of one thing uh -huh. when it was a very big crowd. And um, and mother said she really didn't think the boss would. They just wanted to see Wib Tibbet's daughter, <laughs> Wib Ashby's uh, daughter. Yeah. That, uh, but she, you know, it, it certainly gave her something that was hers too. At it that something time, was hers. You know. uh, she was a uh, yes, her heritage one. And yeah. I think it's a very good book. The reviews, as I say, say that she. Well, mother said she doesn't talk about people belching or that yeah. sort of thing, which is. And that's uh, times have changed, of course. Uh, yeah, very much on that. So, but it is. I think it's funny that some of that, you know, it's kind of like mm -hmm. regional history, regional art from that. 
period, mm -hmm. went through a period of being, you know, criticized for, for yeah. a variety mm -hmm. of things, and now it's it's really kind of on the upswing, and people are much more interested in that yes. things that were produced during that period. Oh, I think it was, and my cousins in the rustic, my cousin Elizabeth, uh, who was always uh, very wisely taking mm -hmm. all the papers and things to the. Uh, Aristic Historical Society because she said the first thing her uh, people in her house would do would be throw them out when, mm -hmm. and, and uh, she was very uh, uh, much a partisan of uh, land under heaven mm -hmm. very much so yeah. <coughs> that was describing Catherine and James uh, okay. background uh, oh. their marriage and so forth oh, and, and right. working in the well I definitely will have to go back and yeah. take a look at it because I, <laughs> I certainly remember uh, hearing about it. I probably, when I did the tapes with her. But, but Mother said when they talked about she, her reluctance to uh, be earthy, mm -hmm. um, in her in her books there was a character I think his name Johnny Parker, an Irishman or something, who now and then makes the, comes in and makes the wisecracks and so mm -hmm. forth. And um, he's modeled on uh, one of the local people, or George Finland, or something oh, like that. Okay. And um, Mother said, uh, you know, to come to the house, he had to go over a little bridge and there was a, with a wooden railing, and he had written on the top of the railing, <coughs> please look on the other side. So he looked down over, and then <laughs> it said, uh, O.M. Good, who was a storekeeper downtown, you kiss my ass. Yeah. <laughs> Mother said you couldn't put that in a book. No, at that point you probably could not. No, no that, that, that is, not this is true. Mm -hmm. Now, one back yeah. up just before we, you know, do anything to leave your mother's family. The Todd jokes were about the Todds. The were Todd. they jokes that the Todds told to people? Well, both of both of them. The Todds were the Todds were a joke in a way. There was one mm -hmm. famous episode when they were. Uh, Right across the road was the swamp, mm -hmm. and uh, Leander went in the, and Lucy went in the swamp, and Lucy climbed a tree, and Leander then cut the tree down, mm -hmm. and it fell, and only she, Lucy was hung up sort of in between, and she was howling and screaming and one thing or another, and old Dan Todd came racing out, and he says, saw what Leander had done, and he says, go home and tell your mother to lick you. <laughs> Don't come here and I'll lick you myself. <laughs> No, by God, I'd kill you. Go home and tell your mother to lick you. That's what, and the Ashbys, who were all mimics and so the WT yeah. and so forth, and um, laughing and howling and so forth. And here's Lucy screaming at the top of the tree. And Leander didn't know whether to go or not. Then, to, then uh -huh. and finally, old Dan dragged him off and said, then I'll take the axe to you. And then Mrs. Todd came screaming up, Don't, Donald, he's our pride and joy. You know? <laughs> all this is saying the country. Uh -huh. And WT would get up on them woodpile and when Dan Todd was coming out and with his old horse, his one, uh -huh. and W.T. would go, caw, 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 caw. <laughs> that meant crowbait as passing, oh, you see. Oh, that's, a, okay. that's the sort of thing that they were all doing. And there were other jokes, and then once uh, at the uh, school, elementary school, there was a little hut for the girls, a little hut for the boys out back, and yeah. Mona was in the, the back house, at the, and it Leander came by and nailed the door shut. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> so she had to scream and haul and get to, then Uncle Frank and Uncle Fred, her brothers, came to get her out, that type of thing. But mainly the Todds would tickle and jump around and make yeah. make up little rhymes about Pearl Ashby, Pearl Ashby is my sweetheart or something like yeah. that. Oh, and this okay. would be, these were the Todd jokes that Mary would do. Mary would tickle. When they were, yeah. I was... Uh, when I was about six or seven, and Mary would have been nine or mm -hmm. ten, um, Mother was shifting the house around, and she put me in the same room with Mary, the great big front rooms, great mm -hmm. big room. Mother said you, both of us would fit in there. I'd previously been in the back stairs. Um, and uh, when I got to the go to bed the first night in the front room, Mary announced that I was going to have to pay her rent. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> and, I couldn't, uh, the rent was that I had to tell her a story every night, a bedtime oh. story, because I would get in bed, just get in bed and fall asleep immediately, and Mary was wanted me put to sleep, as I said. So, and so I had, well, I had a terrible time. Then I discovered that if I went to Mother, Mother could always give me a plot. If you give me the <laughs> plot, 
I could embroider it and work on it because I you talked about food and clothing and various mm -hmm. things, various like the work. Mother never failed. She but on the spur of the moment she could give me, and they were quite good. And she didn't repeat herself on it. And I used to marvel at this because as it went on for two or three years, and then we, by that time Mary, when she went to Gould, dropped the quote, the, yeah. the ranch <laughs> business. And, but, uh, <clears throat> but to say my mother's imagination was constant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, the other thing, I'm looking down the page, the things that, that I wanted to follow up on is, you said your mother didn't like to be called Pearl. What did her friends and other people around town call her? Mrs. Tibbetts. Oh, good heavens. That fascinated me. It fascinated <laughs> me. It fascinated my brother-in-law, who was very uh, fussy about social things, mm -hmm. as I say. Uh, mother, and mother was never self-conscious about it. She'd say, Alice, this is... Beatrice this or Kathy or something, but everybody else called her Mrs. Tibbetts. Mm -hmm. Good heavens, that's, yeah. Because yeah. I was going to ask, who who were some of her? Did she have, you know, girlfriends, social friends? Um, oh, she had friends. She had a lot of friends. friends. Um, she had, the, among all the doctor's patients, everybody yeah. from every neighborhood, when they come in, every neighborhood had some woman who'd come out in the kitchen, sit down in the kitchen and give mother the news. Mm -hmm. And she'd fill her in, as I say. And then when we went to have lunch, at the, the doctor would say, what's going on? Oh. And what did you tell mom tell you? She'd tell us, say, mother would say, oh, hijinks in the Irish neighborhood or something. Mm -hmm. And she'd fill her yeah. in. And she had all the, so all the country women. But the people she liked most and saw the most of... Um, Well, the old ladies at the church in the ladies' club, she was mm -hmm. very fond yeah. of Alice Rowe, who was yeah. Rosalind Rowe's mother. And uh, she liked Maud Fowl, who was the librarian for a while, mm -hmm. very much. She was very fond of her. She was very fond of Ruth Carver. Oh, uh, yeah. Everybody, yeah. of course, loved Ruth Carver, but their mother was particularly fond of her, and they talked a lot about things. She, uh, uh, when she was young and coming into the business of being a doctor's wife, uh, old Madame Twaddle, who was Dr. Wid's mother, mm -hmm. and who had been old Dr. John's wife for 15 years. Madame Twaddle was very kind, and mm -hmm. mother to, and told her how, you know, we do this and do that, and mm -hmm. always have hot water, and <laughs> so forth, and uh, yeah. never, never throw away an old towel, mm -hmm. <laughs> so don't believe me, she didn't. <laughs> this, uh, Alice, of course, our nearby neighbor. Alice Smith. Uh, Alice yes. Smith. Oh, yes. We, yeah. we talked. Up on Broad Street, um, uh, Dorothy Hutchins Fortier, who was uh, who had been in the uh, Campfire Girls and uh, had a terrific sense of humor, she'd come in and visit with Mother. And uh, she was much younger than Mother, but uh, she could, I'd hear these wild laughs and they mm -hmm. both things. And uh, she always uh, enjoyed her. Gee, well, that's, that's a name that's totally new to me. When was she around Bethel? Dorothy. Dorothy. She was around Bethel. She was a campfire girl in 1920, 1910 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, she was around Bethel till about after the war. Well, no, during the war, her husband mm -hmm. was a contractor and they moved to South Par to oh, South yeah. Portland. Oh, and worked okay. At, at worked at, um, there are, let's see... Um, because I'm quite sure on the tapes that I made with your mother, she talked a lot about Alice Smith. Yeah. And I think that, Alice Smith is a very, you know, well, she was sure. a great, uh, mm -hmm. a, but she wasn't exactly a friend. She was a companion in a way, but... Uh, well, the neighbor. I mean, uh, definitely. The neighbor. She yeah. was definitely a neighbor. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but mother liked everybody. She mm -hmm. got along so well with everybody. And uh, she... Uh, all the people at the drugstore, Mr. Carroll was a real friend. Yes. yes. And we had great, uh, she had great contacts back and forth with the drugstore. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ash could go in and read the, all the papers that they were going to, you know, send back and so forth. Yeah. And, and uh, carry them back with uh, Miss old Mrs. Philbrook, who lived in what is now the Victoria House, was a very good mm -hmm. neighbor for years. We played on her lawn and went round, and she never ever said a word about <laughs> keep off the grass or oh, do no. anything. Yeah. Never a great thing. Uh, Dorothy Moore, which she was very fond of, and oh, uh, that's right, I'd forgotten. And Doctor yeah. Doctor Weird, of course, went to stay there. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
mother and the doctor would go with Dor Dorothy and Dr. Weird up to Dr. Dr. Weird at a camp in Gilead. Mm -hmm. And it was, the mother said it was very funny because she said uh, everybody was true to, uh, to nature. Dr. Weird sat there reading that uh, scandal sheet tabloid from, <laughs> from Boston. And your father cut wood and sawed wood like mad and crazy. And Dorothy prepared this a wonderful meal. Mm -hmm. And mother said, <laughs> I went around gathering checker berries and various things to put into mm -hmm. uh, inner gardens where you take oh, a sure. bowl, goldfish bowl and turn it over and uh, fill it with uh, moss and berries and various things for Mary. That's right. Mm -hmm. Just checking to see where we're doing on the... Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been going, it's getting towards an hour and a half. Do you well, feel that, like that's... having a, a no. break? I, the other thing I think might be good is that we I can go look at the, the tapes with your mother. Okay. And then see what topics mm -hmm. need to be expanded mm -hmm. on from that. And then the next time we could certainly work on, you know, Ashby and Mary and, mm -hmm. and the, the other things that were on there. But I think mm -hmm. this has been good. I've, well, if it'd be interesting. Um,